Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the PolicyLink webinar, Creating Equitable Policy Change Through Arts and Culture Strategies. We are very excited for this webinar. We have some incredible guests with us today. Um, I would like to introduce, first of all, my co-moderator, who you should be able to see on your screen which is Maria Rosario Jackson, who is a senior advisor to the arts and culture program at the Kresge Foundation and an institute professor at Arizona State University where she holds appointments at both the Herberger, Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts and the College of Public Service and Community Solutions. In 2013, Maria was appointed by President Obama to the National Council of the Arts and she works as an independent consultant for Kresge um, with the arts and culture program team where she helped develop their creative placemaking strategy. So thank you, Maria, for being with us today. And then next to me, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Jeremy Liu, who is a senior fellow for arts, culture, and equitable development here at PolicyLink. And he's gonna help me uh, set up the framework for today's discussion. And I am Kalima Rose, who is the uh, senior, uh, who is the vice president for strategic directions at Policy Link. Sorry, my title recently changed. Um, and I um, work with the team that advances equitable development policy through arts and culture strategies. If you could go to the agenda slide, Jen. Um, so what we're going to do today um, is give you a presentation um, that frames how uh, we approach arts, culture, and equitable development that is drawn from uh, the policy paper that we just recently published. And hopefully all of you have been able to look at it from your invitation to this webinar. And then we are going to have two moderated discussions that Maria and I will lead with um, the organization Courage with George Galvis and Danielle Mendoza, who um, use arts and culture strategy in amazing policy change work. Then we're going to talk to Kimberly Driggins, who is at the city of Detroit as a planner who uses arts and culture in her land use planning work. And then we're going to have a discussion with all of you. Next, Jen. So here are the guests for today. You can go forward. We will introduce the individual speakers when it's their turn. Um, this is the beautiful uh, creating change through arts, culture, and equitable development. You can go forward. So thank you. Um, we're excited to talk to you today and want to set the, um, the table a little bit about what we mean uh, as we talk about arts, culture, and equitable development. And uh, this slide shows uh, what I think most many of you and certainly our guests and others recognize is that arts and culture is an integral part of what make up a really healthy environment community and uh, as a necessary component of what uh, it means for a community to be equitable. At the same time, we also want to emphasize that there's a real role that we found for arts and culture to help drive uh, equitable policy change in these other sectors as well that um, encompass everything from the environment to education to the economy to uh, um, housing and health. So we're really talking about both of these dimensions when we talk about arts, culture, and equitable development. Next slide. Um, so we really want to, uh, so per that slide, it's really about how uh, arts and culture can support equitable development, but also how uh, policy change can actually support this inter intersection. And I want to maybe speak briefly about an example just from our uh, work here in Oakland around how uh, we really want to um, help both support the arts and culture, particularly the grassroots and community-based organizations that are serving communities of color and low-income communities in Oakland, that are arts and cultural organizations, but also recognizing that their interests are not just focused on cultural expression, right? Their interests are in how to address homelessness and how to address uh, homicides in Oakland and how to address education. So there's a real opportunity here for 
policies in those sectors to support arts and culture, as well as for arts and culture to support equitable policies in those arenas. Next slide. So one of the, um, because we're talking about policy change, uh, which happens in the public sector, we, out of a couple of years of researching best practices across the country, um, we extracted principles that hold true for moving this work. And so I'm just going to share those quickly with you. So one of the ways that um, you can move forward to more equitable development and policy change is by mapping the artistic and cultural assets of your community and um, with an explicit focus on those assets that serve communities of color and low income communities. Next slide, Jim. Um, the second principle is to evaluate the current investments in public works, arts, and culture with data that's disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and neighborhood. And we saw Chicago did a very interesting look at this where they surveyed residents across the city about how well served they were by cultural and arts programming and people on the south and um, west side of Chicago felt that they were not served well at all. And then when they did this mapping exercise, they saw that all the city's resources were going into the north and east side of Chicago. So people's perceptions were close to their experience. Um, next slide, please. Then the third principle is to identify barriers to resources for communities of color and low income communities and restructure processes to engender access to those resources. Next slide. The fourth one is utilize artists and culture bearers to engage community and shape design processes for community development. And I think today you'll get to hear from our guests just about how they've done that. And then the final principle, Jen, is to expand equity focused arts and culture investments across public agencies through community driven cultural plans, through budget appropriations, through targeting allocations to disadvantaged communities and to artists of color and to cultural institutions serving communities of color. Next slide. Oh, sorry, there's one more. No. Um, okay, and then the final one is ensuring that the governance and staffing of agency resources are representative of populations served by the agency. So this is um, Seattle's um, Arts and Culture Commission, and they have recruited people from their different cultural communities to serve in standing up their programs, in allocating resources, and in partnering with other agencies to help collectively move those resources from transportation and other places into more equitable development. Next slide. Great. And so in the paper, you'll find that we really talk about the ways that arts and culture can address equitable development and, and policy change in nine sectors. Uh, including, as you know, the first slide indicated, in the arts and culture field. Certainly, we all know that arts and culture, uh, the, the public funding and processes in that realm have uh, a lot of uh, work to do to be more equitable. So there's some uh, specific, uh, specific examples we provide in the arts and cultural field. But then we go on to talk about transportation, housing. Uh, next slide. Infrastructure and community investments. Uh, one of the key drivers of uh, the way cities and communities uh, develop and change. Uh, economic development, financial security, health and food. And the last three, next slide, youth and education, open space and recreation, technology and information access. Today you'll hear some really great examples and uh, have a discussion around two of these areas, particularly around youth and around economic development from amazing practitioners in the field. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, the, the other resource we offer in the paper is really uh, laying out what we found in uh, a template that helps you uh, recognize the work as it happens in different phases. 
you might be coming from this, these different fields of infrastructure or economic development and are working in either project implementation or short-term planning or long-term planning. We lay out the examples and case studies in uh, those phases to really illustrate uh, two things. One, that the arts and cultural work can actually happen at all of these phases. And in fact, we found that in many times, the earlier arts and culture uh, projects uh, and strategies are involved, the more impactful they can be. Uh, but at the same time, we're, this, as this chart illustrates, that we still have work to do to fill in this chart because we're confident uh, because of where we've seen the work uh, in other places that we don't actually, didn't have room to cover in the paper, that arts and culture actually has a real meaningful uh, implication for equity in each of these phases, in each of these sectors. Next slide. Uh, and uh, you'll again see in a, a different uh, area of work, uh, different uh, examples laid out across this um, uh, timeline. And in the final two slides, you will see that um, the, we have by each sector um, identified the equity goal um, and the policies that can advance that goal and the strategies through arts and culture that can help deliver on that goal. And so this is really the beginning of a framework in an emerging um, field of practice, um, but we have heard a lot of great feedback from colleagues in the field that it's helping them frame and advance their work in more structural ways. And so I think, you know, we're, we're really grateful to our partnership with the Kresge Foundation that have allow, has allowed us to better understand um, some of that structural movement. So with that, I would like to now move forward with um, our guests. So I'm going to thank you, Jeremy, thank for you, your everyone. participation. And I'm going to invite Daniel uh, Mendoza to come and join me and George. And George, if you just want to slide in here a little bit. Uh, Maria, I don't know if you had any thoughts about any of that framework before we sort of shift gears here. Um, just one thought. I, I'd like to add that uh, when you think about arts and culture, I think for this initiative, it's important to keep in mind that um, I think we all operate with a fairly elastic definition, uh, recognizing the value in uh, the kinds of arts and cultural activity that people typically default to, uh, certainly theater and uh, music that is performed uh, professionally and in venues that are specifically um, devoted to arts and culture, and also uh, to the culture bearers that are practicing sometimes in informal contexts or private contexts. Um, I think the other thing to recognize is that it, the art process is as important as the art product. And sometimes uh, mm -hmm. art process even trumps art product. So right. just keeping in mind that elastic definition, <clears throat> it is a broad tent that really um, is inclusive of a wide array of, of aesthetic and cultural expressions is important. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to our other two guests. Um, which come from the organization Courage. And uh, George Galvis is the co-founder and executive director, and he's been there for more than two decades promoting restorative justice and healing to the violence that plagues many Bay Area communities. And he draws upon his experience and in indigenous roots to help young people, particularly those who are involved in the criminal justice system, become future community leaders. And I'll let you tell. I'll let him tell you more about his background. And I'm joined by um, Danielle Mendoza, who is the community organizer at Courage. And um, he first became involved as a participant in their Warriors Circle, which is a positive manhood development program based at the Dewey Academy in Oakland, um, which is a school here. And through his participation in Courage's Warrior Circle, he was recruited as a core group of youth leaders for a participatory research project that was led by Courage, um, which culminated in a photo novella um, report, Forgotten Voices, Youth Solutions for Oakland. 
And so I would like to begin with um, asking George um, and Daniel if you can tell us about the kind of policy change work you've been involved in through Courage and um, other coalitions that Courage participates in. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us. I'm extremely humbled and honored to participate um, in this webinar. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, we don't necessarily or haven't necessarily always identified as a cultural and arts organization. Um, but I think we're beginning to really kind of embrace that more as our part of our identity. Uh, we do, however, really believe in the philosophy that culture is healing, la cultura cura. And that is a uh, part of our of, of the you know core tenements of how we approach the culturally rooted healing uh, centered youth organizing and leadership development work that we do. Um, so courage is just a little uh, is, is is in its sixth year. We're relatively young, but we're not necessarily new to this work. I've been engaged in this kind of work for um, almost 24 years now, um, and I'm formerly incarcerated. 70% of my staff are formerly incarcerated, and half of my board are formerly incarcerated. Um, and our mission is to really elevate the voice and power of systems impacted youth and to help them transform their lives and to really find their agency as change makers to improve outcomes uh, for other similarly impacted young people. And so um, we do that in a number of ways. I'll share a little bit of our creation story is we were born out of the gang injection organizing here in Oakland. So some of you may recall uh, 2010, our former city attorney and former police chief thought it'd be a great idea to impose gang injunctions in our communities and some of us in the community side felt that that was just another draconian policy that was going to criminalize youth of color and um and that you know and, and we also knew that it was not necessarily a way to improve public safety for communities as the folks who come from those communities we have a vested interest in that as the ones who have to organize the car washes to bury our young people when violence occurs uh, you know, we have a vested interest in that, but folks who weren't necessarily as uh, in, impacted in our, you know, uh, as you know, from our communities were making decisions unilaterally and trying to build political careers um, based on, you know, this sort of criminalization of youth through the gang injunctions. And so uh, we knew this, this was really fundamentally about displacement and gentrification, the two neighborhoods that they um, that they decided to pilot the gang injunctions were North Oakland and Fruitvale. Neither one of them necessarily had the highest crime rates, but they were both very right for gentrification. Fruitvale has been kind of compared to San Francisco's Mission District, as um, you know, and you know, and those of you who are familiar with the Mission District, it's you know, it was kind of like the Latino barrio of San Francisco. There was a lot of sort of cultural amenities. Uh, there was a, a history of sort of mural art um, and. Um, and, and you know other sorts of uh, other sorts of things that really created a vibrant community, and that's really how Fruitvale's kind of perceived now that a lot of that is spilling over to the Oakland side. And North Oakland is really kind of ripe around sort of being framed as this biotech corridor. So that's where like Kaiser, Summit Hospital, uh, Alta Bates, and a number of those folks, what they call Peel Hill, so all the pharmaceutical companies are kind of located right there. And I think that the city planners of Oakland really had a vision of creating this biotech corridor along that area. And so um, once again, uh, just to illustrate the point, this wasn't about public safety, this was about displacement. So uh, what you'll see right here is an image of the photo novella that we created, Forgotten Voices, a youth vision for Oakland. So that was a youth-led social action research project um, that really illustrated our young people's uh, authentic stories. Daniel, in particular, who's one of the co-authors of that, um, his stories really uh, reflected in this in terms of how we just don't create any space for young people to just be youth. So in the context of school, they're being criminalized. In the context of their community, even in front of their homes, particularly as neighborhoods are experiencing gentrification and new residents are moving in, um, you know, they're being criminalized even just for hanging out in front of their home. So what I may actually do at this point is give Daniel an opportunity if he wants to kind of share a little bit about his experience of how he got involved with, uh, with Courage and the photo novella experience and maybe some of his vision of how he sees us using culture as really one of our, um, our tools of resistance for to, to, to advance social justice and movement building. <clears throat> Hello everybody, my name is Daniel Mendoza, 21 years old. Um, I first got involved with Courage at 17 when I was at Dewey High School, which was my fifth high school at the time. Um, all through school, I've been labeled problematic, ADHD, whatever that is. Um, and I was in the first positive management development class, the Warrior Circle at Dewey, where uh, George was one of my teachers. And uh, during that time, I had a lot of anger towards the school system, a lot of anger towards the police, 
Um, I just couldn't escape all forms of oppression uh, from the way I left the house to when I came home. Uh, during that time, George gave me the opportunity to participate in the photo novella called For Forgotten Voices, which we're able to talk about some of the issues such as violence, police brutality, the school system not, not really uh, appreciating us and opening us up norms. And yeah, it gave, me, it gave me an outlet to talk about some of the issues that were going on. And um, at that time, I was very angry. You know, just I felt like everything was failing me. Um, during this time, I caught a case where I was incarcerated for two years. Um, during this whole time, George and Courage advocated for me and, and let me know that they didn't forget about me. Um, upon my release, a week out, George offered me a job. No background check needed. <laughs> I was there uh, working there. I've been working there for ever since, for about a year and a half now. Um, I first started working there with La Cultura Cura Coffee Cafe, and now I'm mostly doing some program of development curriculum and helping the youth out with different things. Um, the main thing that I've got from Courage is relationships before task. Before I was able to even to trust George or listen to him, they showed me that there's different outlets than what I was doing. They showed me, they taught me about my history. They taught me about my culture. They talk about the art that was going on in my communities. Um, so during my whole time of incarceration, these thoughts stayed with me, these seeds planted and, they, and I read and I grew. And as an individual, when I was released, I just wanted to do the same work that George was doing. Um, so I've been doing that ever since. And I'm taking all the same teachings that George taught me to the youth now. I can't ask the youth to show up for a, a direct action or some type of policy advocacy work without building trust and relationships with these people. Because as we all know, hurt people hurt people. And that's, that's what's going on in our communities. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing I got from Courage. And just as Daniel said, hurt people hurt people. We also know that healed people heal people. So as, um, as someone who's formerly incarcerated, as someone who experienced profound um, violence in my home and then reproduce that violence on the streets. Um, and Daniel, certainly um, his story, which, you know, we certainly don't have the benefit of time to really kind of get deeper into the, those kinds of details. You know, um, we began our healing journey and it really becomes sort of a, you know, this concept of each one, reach one, teach one. So, um, so, so our own healing begins to inform the healing processes of other people and our communities. Um, to kind of provide like a little kind of historical context, and I hope this doesn't uh, take folks uh, back too much. I really kind of feel like it's helpful for us just to kind of think comparatively, uh, you know, that 1492 really kind of um, is an indicator for a, a, a clash between two irreconcilable worldviews. You know, that of, uh, of this concept of interconnectedness and interdependence, which is really reflected in the Native American expression of Mithaki Asin, all my relations, or in Lakesh, uh, you are my other self. And, um, and the capitalist expression of maximize profits, minimize expenditures. Of course, at that time in 1492, it was really about greed, gold, and genocide, the three Gs. And as a result of that, we have legacies of colonialism that have created historical intergenerational trauma. So as a result of, uh, you know, by virtue of who we are in, in, in indigenous communities, as uh, you know, uh, we, we have what we call post-colonial stress disorder and what the African-American community describes as post-slave stress syndrome. And so we really use culture as part of the way to transform, as part of our healing, as part of our strength, and as part of our recovery. But we also use it, as Malcolm described, as an, as an indispensable tool in the freedom struggle. And so it also becomes a way that we express ourselves, the way that we find our voice, the way we find our power. Um, and, um, and the way that we build movement. And so you'll see right here, this is a photo of a mural community and you'll see what it says is that community, building community from the ground up. You know, so this is really about how we do community development beyond bricks and mortar. You'll see that there's a group of middle school students, uh, sixth graders who are, you know, holding a circle space right there and just kind of meditating in the community garden. This community garden, just so folks know too, is located in the gang injunction zone. It was, um, basically a dumping site for about 10 years. It was just a place where people did illegal dumping, tires, refrigerators, weeds as tall as me. And, um, and the young men who were defendants in the gang injunction who are currently my staff, when we began to kind of talk with them about their vision for their community, they identified this as a place that could be a vibrant community building space and a garden. And 
They talked about a vision for their community in which there should be murals that reflected their stories, similar to communities like the Mission District and San Diego and others. And so we tested the soil, we saw that it wasn't toxic, and we rolled up our sleeves and without any real resources, but just kind of people power, we cleaned up all the garbage and we created a vibrant community building space that pulls together like a whole bunch of different folks from different kinds of communities. There's, you know, although this is the barrio of, of Oakland, so it's predominantly considered predominantly a Latino community, even among the Latino community, there's a lot of diversity because there's many folks who uh, their first language is an indigenous language, and they're coming from Zapotec communities or different Mayan communities, um, or from Oaxaca and other places. But there's also a significant Southeast Asian community, Cambodian, Hmong, Mian, African American, um, Chinese, and um, and uh, an urban American Indian communities. And you'll see, like, on any given day, like you'll see all these folks. You'll see, you know, uh, an Asian elder, a tatted up homie. You know what I'm saying? In there in the community garden, people who would normally have like relationships with each other, interface, and it also turns out when we did the research that the slumlord who was allowing this blight uh, to take place happened to be the city of Oakland, the same entity that was criminalizing and labeling our young men as the worst of the worst and sociopaths. And so we kind of use this as leverage and as ammunition to really kind of push back on the city when it ended up being those young men that they were, um, you know, placing these negative stigmas and labeling on who actually cleaned up the city's mess and turned this into a vibrant community building space. Maria, do you have a question? I think, yeah, I have a question for Daniel. When, when you started working with La Cultura Cura, did you have, um, how was your interpretation of, of working in art and culture? I mean, was that something that was immediately comfortable for you or, or did you find that you grew into it or how was that? I didn't think it was possible for somebody coming from where I come from and, and you know, my background to have a job like that or to even see that on a daily basis. It feels wonderful going into a community and seeing art that my friends created and being around people that look like me. So um, I didn't think that was possible. And with the help of courage, I've gotten exposure, which I think is the most valuable thing is that the youth don't know what they're capable of if they don't see it, if they don't have people telling them that you can do this or that you can, you know, that there's different options out there. So I think that was the most valuable thing is that the exposure, they gave me the outlets, the tools, the, the, even the physical spray paint or whatever, you know what I mean? Like they gave me the, the opportunities. And what I'll share too is we, you know, we created a social enterprise to employ formerly incarcerated youth. So that was sort of the first space and opportunity that um, that we recruited Daniel to participate in. But we really saw this as an opportunity, you know, this the social enterprise, this concept of La Cultura Cura Cultural Arts Cafe as both employment, entrepreneurial sort of training for young people, but also a community building space. A cultural outlet. There aren't that many cultural outlets for them in East Oakland, you know, so we have a lot of spaces where they come and they have spoken word events, there's dance, there's music, there's, you know, hip hop. We really use culture for community building and, um, you know, because ultimately everything is about relationships, you know what I mean? And so, you know, we, we, we definitely put energy into kind of smashing on the system, but, you know, I think some of the most sacred work we do is really around how we transform energy and how we build community using culture and arts. So I know um, PolicyLink does a fair amount of um, policy related work in the city of Oakland and I often see courage at um, events that have to do with um, with anti-displacement policy or um, other things. So I'm just wondering um, if you could at sort of a high level talk to us about, I understand that you were the first to get a gang injunction rolled back in any city in the US. Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk about the other kinds of policy interventions that you have um, participated in. Absolutely. So um, as of March 2015, we became the, the first um, documented uh, community organizing effort that we're aware of in the nation to fully defeat a gang injunction and in that the gang injunctions were lifted and all cases were dismissed for both the North Oakland and Fruitville gang injunctions. It became a political hot potato. Nobody in City Hall now will even mention a gang injunction as a public safety strategy. We really try to push this concept uh, that we're continuing to advocate for of uh, youth empowerment zones versus gang injection zones. Let's really build on the strengths of our young people. And, you know, and arts and culture is one of those opportunities when we start 
kind of asset mapping, what are some of the community treasures, and really kind of building on the strengths of young people. Um, when we did the photo novella, for example, we used theater of oppressed really to kind of like do the storyboarding to help the young people illustrate their authentic stories. Daniel shared a story that's featured in the photo novella of how, you know, during the Los Muertos, you know, there was sort of this cultural voyeurism taking place and hipsters and the homies who were there gathered to really try to honor authentically one of their loved ones who had passed away, which is a very cultural, culturally appropriate time to do that, are getting hemmed up and jammed up by the police. And as a result of the gang injection, we were seeing folks who were being criminalized for non-criminal behavior. Um, in addition to that, to, you know, we, um, we became co-authors of a state ballot initiative called Proposition 57. Uh, what we really began to do is look at Proposition 21, which we, was passed by California voters in 2000, and we refer to that as sort of the Criminalization of Youth Act. Uh, and one of the things that it did that we were able to change is that it gave the power to district attorneys to directly file and charge youth as young as 14 years old as adults for certain criminal uh, charges and so we took away that power from the district attorneys and brought and gave it back to judges we shifted the burden of proof from the defense to the prosecution which is significant and we are able now to make all future changes legislatively to proposition 21 with the simple 50 percent majority instead of a two-thirds majority which would have been required because it was a bad initiative and so we are now using that as part of our legislative platform we've also passed a lot of ledge I think, you know, when we walk the halls of Sacramento, it's much different when they have young people who are coming directly from these communities, uh, talking to their elected representatives. And we don't necessarily, con you know, like as Audrey Lord kind of went, you know, said, you know, we, we learn the tools, but we don't play by the rules, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, you know, there's sort of a typical way of doing policy advocacy at the state capitol, but we've really kind of linked it to our organizing. So we show up deep. We've mobilized as many as 500 people to the state capitol. We bring banners. We bring spoken word and hip hop and poetry, and we do rallies right on the state capitol steps. And then we take it into the halls and we do ledge visits with our and, uh, with our elected uh, you know, officials. And so they're hearing directly from young people who've been impacted by these communities. So I think as a result of that, you've seen in California in the last few years, a real shift in the way that the criminal injustice system has, um, you know, we've been able to impact it to really try to put the justice instead of a just us system. You know, so there's a number of things we've been successful with doing and, you know, um, and, and you'll see that illustrated, you know, through a number of bills, which I probably don't have the benefit and time of talking about, but Courage itself has been a co-sponsor of a number of bills around police accountability, around reentry employment, and, um, and around just improving outcomes for young people who are impacted by the system. And those policies are crafted by our young people. So even the way we use culture to tell stories, we hold circle process. We do research really as ceremony because we recognize that research, particularly quantitative research or ethnographic research is about storytelling. And we let that inform and really kind of, uh, inf you know, inform our, our policy priorities and, um, and, and drive, you know, the campaigns that we are engaged in. So thank you so much um, to both you, George, and you, Daniel. Um, we're going to come back to you in a bit with some more questions. <coughs> The way that we structured today was to um, have George and Daniel reflect the way that arts and culture strengthens their ability to bring community change from the grassroots and to intervene in policies that are negatively impacting them and to put forward a more positive vision. And now we're going to sort of switch tracks and go over to Detroit where Kimberly Driggins is um, a planner. And let's see, I'm sure that I just had her bio here with me. Um, so Kimberly is um, the city of Detroit's director of strategic planning, where Hi. she is responsible for developing several citywide planning initiatives that um, include their updated comprehensive plan, an open space plan, a historic preservation plan, and an arts and culture plan. And before she was at the city of Detroit, she worked for the District of Columbia's Office of Planning for seven years and um, engaged in several planning studies that had to do with housing economic development and where she advanced arts and culture through those strategies. And so um, thank you, Kimberly, for joining us today. Maybe we just need a word from, I can see that we're having a little PowerPoint challenge. Are we abandoning the PowerPoint for now? And 
Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so Kimberly, uh, we're going to start with you, and I'm going to let uh, Maria ask you the first question that she has. And in about two minutes, we should have the PowerPoint back up. So just know that it will be coming. No problem. Kimberly. Hi. Hi, everybody. A question for you. Can you talk a little bit about how um, arts and culture is present in your planning work currently? Currently. Sure. Well, um, and I was, uh, so my title, I mean, is, is Director of Strategic Planning slash Arts and Culture. So it's a mouthful. Um, and it's really, I have a dual role here um, at the city of Detroit. Um, and I am within the planning and development department. And it is everything that Kalima um, articulated uh, just a few minutes ago. But the arts and culture piece, it's interesting because um, you know, the city of Detroit um, does not have a, a cultural affairs or arts and culture um, commission um, at, at the municipal level. So um, we're trying to reestablish that. There's a very vibrant and dynamic arts and culture community um, in the city of Detroit. There's several um, nonprofits and artists that are doing amazing and dynamic work. Um, however, there has not been a city hall presence or um, agency or mind um, thinking about arts and culture um, in the last several years. So um, I always like to tell people that I'm a beginning, not an end point um, with respect to the administration. Um, it, it's, it's landed here um, within the planning development department because we believe very strongly that arts and culture has the power to uplift communities and there it's a it's a vital strategy in our community engagement and our planning work so um we um really take uh really think that um communities have arts and culture all communities have arts and culture and we try to uplift that in our neighborhood planning efforts um in our most recent round of rfps actually we ask for um you know that artists be included um in the request for proposals for our planning work. Um, we're looking to uh, create an artist in residence program within the planning development department. Yes, that is correct. That's very unusual, but we're really thinking about how can we leverage what we consider to be um, an asset, a competitive asset of the city of Detroit and a, a very meaningful and productive conversation around neighborhood vitaliz revitalization and change, um, which, is, which has been, um, really interesting here and we think that artists um, are central to that conversation. You know Kimberly it seems um, that to use artists in planning work that you need artists with a very particular orientation to social practice um, yes. and so how do you how does a city government find and work with artists in this manner and what kinds of things do they do for you? Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think I can talk about it more from my experience in DC. I just, I, I have been um, in the city of Detroit for eight months or nine months um, and we're still really sort of in the formative stages of thinking about how this will, how we'll, how we'll implement um, the strategies here in Detroit. I've really been on a listening tour um, the last seven to eight months to really understand um, the unique assets that are here to understand and get to know the artist community because I think that it's not a one-size-fits-all strategy so I have no intention of um, importing what I did in Washington DC to Detroit because Detroit's a very different city and it's taking time to really understand the the, the very uh, rich and uh, dynamic landscape here um, before uh, we as an office kind of put forth um, some concrete strategies. Um, however, um, to answer your question in terms of how we did that in, in, in DC, um, you're totally right. I mean, um, we really have done the work sort of under the creative placemaking, placekeeping umbrella, and it is really around social practice, and not all artists are interested necessarily in contributing in that manner, and that's fine. We actually um, work with a lot of arts organizations, um, arts-based organizations in the neighborhood, um, to kind of help identify those artists. Um, this is where I wish the uh, <laughs> the slides were available. But um, so I'll just say that, you know, we, we quantified, you know, we started by um, doing a series of studies. I mean, that's how we started in DC. 
uh, going back to our comprehensive plan with an arts and culture um, element um, that led to um, a, cu a cultural economy study in 2010 that actually quantified the impact of arts and culture and that actually got people's attention in City Hall. So, you know, it's interesting because the role that I play is really a translator, um, you know, translating to government officials about why they should care about arts and culture and the value that arts and culture can bring to community. And then also sort of translating to community about um, community engagement techniques. So, you know, really quickly, um, you know, what we did back five, six years ago, seven years ago, there have been continuous updates to that thinking. Um, DC's currently in the midst of a cultural plan. Um, and you know, how this lands in place, um, which I think is you know, directly your question, is that we knew through the study where um, this was happening organically, and we sought to really sort of do some pilot projects and, and amplify what was already going on so we had some seed money through Art Place America to actually sort of pilot and test sort of the ideas that were emerging in our studies. That's how we actually started the work. Um, one of the first projects and most successful uh, was Luminate Anacostia. And anyone who knows anything about Washington, D.C., Anacostia is in an area of town that had not been seeing um, a robust revitalization effort. And was uh, there were several challenges. Um, in the neighborhood. If you could just pause on that slide for a second, please. Okay. Um, um, you know, this this area of town east of the river is physically separated from the rest of Washington, D.C. So there's an isolation there. And, um, you know, they had higher unemployment rate. Um, there was a high recidivism rate um, in wards seven and eight. And um, there were struggling um, commercial retail. Uh, there's a lot. There was a lot going on there. So. Um, this this festival, um, which we partnered with a local uh, community development corporation, Arch Development Corporation, who had been in the community since the early 90s and had a real good sense of the pulse of the community. And they also helped, they, we, we subgranted the funds to this organization um, and they actually executed the project. Um, you know, we helped them think about um, partners and potential sponsors um, but it was really sort of their um, footprint in terms of thinking about how this should go. And the Luminate Anacostia Festival um, really was very successful. It took place over the course of three months. Um, one of the, the things that happened there was that it really brought people east of the river who had never been over there. Um, there were a number of things that happened um, toward the end of the, the, the festival, one of which, Busboys and Poets, which is a a really popular restaurant in DC had a pop-up um, restaurant during uh, Luminate Anacostia during the opening festival. They had never set foot um, east of the river before, um, and this was their sort of first physical presence. As a result, um, and I'm sure there were other things, I'm sure that Andy Shalal, the owner, was thinking about moving into the area, but I think that this was sort of catalytic um, uh, for, for them and they started thinking about, you know, having a, a physical presence, a permanent presence east of the river. Um, you know, I'm happy to report that, you know, five years later, um, you know, that Busboys and Poets is opening in Anacostia. And not only is it going to be a sit down restaurant, which is desperately needed in that area. Also, they're doing there's a workforce training component. As I mentioned, there was a high unemployment rate in this area. So, you know, they're very much uh, social activists. Um, in their own right and, you know, decided on their own accord that they would help meet the challenge of the area by providing um, a, a, a hospitality and culinary leadership institute, um, really sort of a training um, so folks could be employed in the neighborhood that wanted a job could be, could have those jobs available. Um, so that's one, one example. Um, there are several, I'm going to pause there in the interest of time and sort of let the questions keep going. Um, I have a couple of other examples, but uh, I want to be responsive to you guys. Do you want to just let the slides play forward now? Sure. Okay, great. And Maria, do you have a question for Kimberly? Yeah, I do. So, so that Busboys and Poets is moving into Anacostia is really significant, and that it's doing so with uh, such a social conscience uh, is important. And my question to you as a planner how do you encourage that kind of business development 
um, that is outward looking and generous in its approach, um, that sees assets in that neighborhood, uh, not in a way that is uh, colonial in a sense, but right. that also build up the assets as it becomes part of that community. How do you encourage that kind of development as opposed to development that wouldn't do that? Well, that's a tough question, Maria. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, the short answer is that, you know, we, we're really trying to think about policies and like the policies led to what well, we need to really show people what we mean. So we really sort of got into the planning and development department in DC, really got into doing these sort of demonstration projects to really show people policy can be very abstract and very sort of obtuse and like what all arts, the arts and culture strategies allowed us to do was to actually physically show people what we meant. And what you're seeing um, in the background is another project. And like, you know, it was a very different situation. So this was, this project is Upper Northwest, just north of Columbia Heights. And, you know, the business um, core, the co commercial corridor there was struggling. Um, you know, every, everyone was going to Columbia Heights and really not going north of there. And so the businesses were struggling we were doing an active neighborhood planning process um, when we had these monies available and we decided to come up with an arts and culture intervention that actually would promote local business development so sometimes it's not a you know a big re restaurant uh, uh, person coming into a neighborhood but it's actually um, helping the mom and pop organizations and the mom and pop restaurants that are already there and honestly if you've ever run a, a mom and pop operation all you know it that's that's a that's a you know 24 7 job so you know what the planning department was able to bring was actually the vision the idea and the artists and to kind of think about okay how can we um highlight these businesses that would attract more foot traffic to these businesses that design intervention artistic expression was in the form of um temporary urban street furniture and so we worked with um the rebar group who's no longer in existence, they're now Gale Studio. Um, we worked with them and we actually came up with, you know, you're seeing right now this design charrette. We actually um, asked people to show us what you'd like us to construct. And it was very hands-on. It was actually creative itself, the design workshop. It wasn't just dots on a whiteboard, um, tell us what you think, but it was actually, no, show us, you know, um, construct, make, what you would like to see. We took those ideas, we did some prototyping, and then we did a design build workshop actually on the corridor. Um, and we had the furniture prefabricated with a local um, manufacturer. So, you know, we're really about keeping dollars local. And in all the projects that we do, we really try to employ artists that are living in the area, if not the neighborhood, and certainly within the city. Um, there's definitely goals around that. Um, and with this project in particular, um, there was a series of three discrete interventions that we used with the street furniture and it culminated, if you can keep going with the slides, please. It culminated in this um, food festival that was this open kitchen um, crawl, like it was culture and food. And what, after the furniture was constructed, we, we um, enlisted the business's help and being um, stewards of the furniture that was constructed. And these were um, high top tables, these were benches, these were planters. Um, you know, we, we really wanted the community. Very challenging, to be honest. We had some language um, barriers. We had to get translators and folks to kind of help us communicate. Um, but we worked through that. Um, and these are some of the, what you're seeing now, are some of the pieces There were over um, 40 pieces, if you can hold on that slide, there were over 40 pieces um, constructed and the open kitchen culture crawl was this food music festival and it rotated down the corridor, which was actually like 1.3 miles. So it was a fairly long corridor and um, the activation of that. And what that did actually, it was actually successful in, you know, highlighting the businesses that some of the business owners did not know one another. They found out that they had some commonality and what ended up happening there was um, an, a merchants association was created as a result of this um, project. And um, this, this area and this area and um, this um, 
this community was able to attract additional resources because they were um, organized and mobilized as a result of this planning process um, and, and um, arts and culture um, intervention. So um, it's not always you know, a big name that has to come in and help a community, but we're also kind of thinking about how do we help the small mom and pop shops and, and, and not be a burden to them, but how can we help uplift them, but not burden them? And that's always um, a difficult balance. Kimberly, what would you say to your peers um, in the public sector um, about how to approach using arts and culture for investing in more equitable development in communities that have been underinvested or divested? Yeah, I think it's um, you know, it's a great another great question. I mean, I think that we really need to as public, as public servants. And you know, I'm a planner, urban development professional, um, but I understand, I kind of un intrinsically understand the value of arts and culture, but not everybody does. I mean, so it can be quite a frustrating conversation to have within the confines of City Hall. And I find that you have to really actually meet people where they are, no matter where you are, whether you're in the community or whether you're in City Hall. And like the first thing in City Hall that people listen to is actually sort of the impact. And again, sort of being this translator. So if you can actually, have some type of data around the impact that arts and culture is having in your city or in your community. Um, the asset mapping that George spoke to earlier, um, I think that's also very powerful. People don't often know what resources are in a community. Um, sometimes you can't always start with data, but you can start with, okay, this is who's here. I think data is actually very powerful. are what people sort of respond to um, and the potential economic um, impact um, for communities. That presents a very compelling case to actually move forward with some of the strategies. And it's, this is not just where, you know, things are working well, but, you know, where things are not working as well, um, you know, and, and arts and culture, for me, I have a very broad definition. You know, I talked a lot about the culinary arts. It's not, for me, just performing arts but it's a very sort of broad, the broadest definition possible, um, but it's around cultural production, it's around cultural heritage, it's around values of neighborhoods. And um, you have to present not just um, the, the, the economics of it, but the social narrative um, of it. And I think those two things in, in, in conjunction with one another presents a very compelling case. Um, Thank you, Kimberly, and um, I'm sorry for the little bit of technical challenge, but we did enjoy seeing the beautiful um, images of the work that you have been able to move forward. So I just want to encourage the participants out there across the nation in this webinar of sending any questions that you have for Daniel or George or Kimberly um, or reflections that you would like to share from doing this kind of work yourself that we could translate out to the audience. Um, Maria, I don't know if you have some follow-up questions that might bring these two conversations together, these two examples together. Sure, one question I think I have for both of you is, um, you've been at this for some years in, in your respective roles, and I, I'd be interested to hear how your understanding of the role of arts and culture in um, improving opportunity in communities, um, how that's evolved over time. I mean, where, when you started this work, what did you think and how is it different from what you think now? Sure, um, I'll, I'll start if that's okay, George. Um, I mean, I think for, I think for us, um, or for me, I wasn't really sure what, you know, I didn't have that many kind of preconceived notions of what it was going to be. <clears throat> you know, this was pretty early on. Um, and I think it was sort of, for us, pivoting arts and culture from something that was just over there, um, something that was more not, that it wasn't an integral strategy to the work that we were doing. I mean, so that, that in and of itself was sort of a major pivot. Um, and then in addition to that, we weren't sure about how it was going to actually play out on the ground. And, you know, what we discovered was that arts and culture was, you know, a very uh, effective way at building community 
and also community engagement. And also it brought different people that would not have been engaged otherwise into a planning process. And again, planning processes are dry and they're sometimes abstract. And sometimes we just, we, just, it, it, we always have a challenge engaging people around planning um, uh, for the most part, um, unless it's like a, a hot button issue um, and people are like all excited about it. But sometimes it's usually just the same folks that show up time and time again to a planning meeting. So what we found was that arts and culture really broadened our conversation and it brought right. different people, different types of people um, into the conversation and it led to better outcomes. It, you know, you know, you always want as many people as possible um, contributing their voice to a planning process. And this was a fun way. Um, you know, there was no sort of barrier to entry. People weren't, I think planning can be a little, um, uh, again, abstract, maybe even intimidating in terms of some of the concepts. We were able to be able to sort of break down some of our planning concepts into something that was more physical um, and to really be able to um, invite more people into the conversation. So, you know, we learned a lot. And, um, you know, we, before I left, we had pretty much put in money for all of our planning projects to have some type of uh, concrete placemaking component, um, early stage implementation of ideas um, before I left DC. That is certainly something that I am looking to um, recreate here in the city of Detroit. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I know a lot because I've been at it for a while and, you know, becoming more ambitious in, in the plans and the integration, of arts and culture and planning. And because the landscape here is so um, dynamic in the city of Detroit, there's so many artists, I think that, you know, the artists in residence program and kind of thinking about um, how we land some of these interventions in some of our emerging neighborhoods and some of our commercial corridors, um, you know, we actually have to kind of catch up on the policy side, but I'm really, I'm really ready to go sort of on the arts and culture side and doing some um, activation of, of areas in, in the city of Detroit. Thank you. So, so for us, I think, um, and this kind of goes back to what I shared earlier about not always necessarily identifying as a cultural and arts organization. Um, you know, for us, our culture is really sacred. And you know, so there's even sort of this phenomenon of sort of um, cultural voyeurism, cultural exploitation, um, and commodification of our culture now, you know, how, and, and, and so that can be something that's really problematic. And so um, in some ways, culture is not always something that should be on public display from our perspective. It's something that's also deeply personal, but how we, but how we bring our community together. And, uh, and I'll just kind of share more specifically an example, you know, really coming out of my own incarceration um, and then connecting to some of my elders who really began to help connect me to our traditional ceremonies. So, you know, we're not going to you know, um, we're not going to put something like that in a report. We're not going to prove the absolute efficacy of a sweat lodge and do a pre-post test. You know what I mean? We're not going to undermine the sacred integrity of those things. But that's something that's been part of our healing since time immemorial. It's part of our culture. And, you know, and connecting to that drum and that heartbeat of the grandmother and, and learning all those songs, how we reclaim, how we relearn. You know, there's kind of like this concept in academia uh, that, you know, they refer to as sort of, de you know, de decolonial studies, right? Uh, and, but I, I mean, sometimes I think that we have to, I don't know, I almost want to teach a course on decolonizing decolonial studies, because I think that, you know, from engaging with some of my folks in academia, it's like there's so much intellectual masturbation going on, and there's this intellectual concept of indigeneity, but it's connect, it's disconnected from any kind of spirituality. So um, that for us is really important. Spirituality becomes the way that we do a lot of our transformative healing work. Um, then there's also the cultural piece that is for sort of public consumption because it becomes part of our communication strategy for movement building and for campaigns. And so to your point, Maria, earlier of how you talked about how process really trumps product, that really is, is, is like, that's key to how we do things. So everything from example, the photo novella project, you know, before we even began, you know, um, when we talked about really using this concept of photo voice as a research method and recognizing that both planning and research are ways of recolonizing communities of color, um, 
you know, we actually, you know, we smudged everybody down and we really kind of, um, you know, we offered a, you know, we offered an honoring song to really try to, uh, uh, you know, honor people for being able to uh, reopen their wounds to teach, to teach and share their stories in a sacred manner. And, um, and, and so, you know, we asked everyone to bring a photograph to just kind of show the power of photos that was important to them. And for many of our young people, those were photos of uh, loved ones who had been killed in the violence in Oakland. And so clearly, you know, um, we opened a lot of wounds. Um, but that process and going through that process is what made it so powerful. And then how their authentic stories really became, like there's so many anecdotal kind of things that we could just sort of superficially cut and paste, but having it really belong to the young people um, and share their stories in an authentic manner, I think was critical. Even the way we do murals, like um, we see, you know, a lot of murals, if you're just trying to get a mural done, uh, for the purpose of public consumption um, and aesthetics, you know, and, you know, and I'm also guilty, I'm formally incarcerated, but I have a master's in city planning from Berkeley, um, you know, so uh, uh, that's another conversation, but, um, but, you know, city planning gets very consumed with the, with the concept of how, you know, uh, of the aesthetic without really, really sometimes um, digging deeper around sort of the social implications. So with every mural that we did, we didn't, you know, what, what, what some people call a design charrette, we really just kind of put our community together and asked them, well, what's your vision? What would you like to see in this mural? What are the issues impacting our community the most? So really just kind of a very basic focus group, but not something so formal that it almost felt a little alienating from the folks in the neighborhood. It was informal conversations that we kind of got their input. And then we invited them to come and put their fingerprints on it. So when you'll see like that, one of the flagship murals that's on there, it will say over a hundred hands, touch this mural and we're involved in it. And we have a big, you know, uh, community block party. We close off the block. We don't ask permission from the city. We're sick and tired of asking permission from the city for our, you know, for autonomy over our own neighborhoods. We put out our own cones and we have the homies from the neighborhood do security and shut down the block. And we bring our danzantes, our Aztec dancers to do a blessing. And we bring our young people to share their songs, their poetry, their dance as part of this community celebration. And we have a DJ spin some music so we can kind of have sort of that backyard boogie kind of feel to it. So it feels, you know what I mean? And we break, you know, and we share food, which becomes a really sacred part of sort of how we build community too. So all of that, I think I, I'm illustrating to really just kind of punctuate the point around process and why process is really, is really more important than just the finished product, you know? So um, I wanted to just thank you for making that point earlier. Um, Daniel, um, it sounds like you were in the warrior circle, maybe that was four years ago. Yeah. So I think in thinking about Maria's question, um, from the time that you first started experiencing these um, cultural practices to what you do now as a community organizer, um, what, what has that arc been for you and what do you bring now when you're working to organize your community? Okay. When I first started, I had the perception I should be good at art to do art, which is not true at all. Um, like you said, you know, the process is more important than the product. Now I have an understanding that art is a way of, of healing, it's a way of, of uniting people. It's a way of time consuming that uh, could ever be used in, in the wrong way. But that's where, I, that's where I'm at now, is I see that, that art and culture is something that everybody in the community should grasp. Not just the people that are interested or, or want to do it, or talented or talented at it. Um, yeah. I think it's something that all our youth that come to our organization, all our folks that come to our events, get exposed to the art and come out feeling that they're capable of going, coming out with the, with the attitude that they're going to share to the rest of the community. So we got one question in from um, the audience that was asking about how you successfully engage um, <clears throat> the public in projects that have to do with design um, for the community. And it seems like that photo novella project you did was a community engagement process. Could you just describe that a little bit more about, I understand it was participatory, like what did you do and what came out of it and has what came out of it manifested for your community? Just to give context, it was a time where a lot of our, a lot of our, our friends were, were uh, 
being locked up. A lot of our family members were dying. Um, so, so when the opportunity, George gave us the opportunity to talk about some of the things that were going on and to, to be to have total control of what goes into that photo novella, it, it, some of us felt like our duty, it felt like we had to, like, we should do it. Um, not only that, the school system wasn't really, you know, they weren't, I remember security guards used to call us a little cartel. And you know what I mean? That's like, like things like that, it, it just doesn't make you feel good as a student. So um, we were asked to gather up pictures of our community. And uh, within two days, we brought back pictures. And like George said, some of those pictures were of, of hipsters with, with paint on the face for during, uh, reclaiming during uh, the Day of the Dead. And it was, it was just, it just wasn't right. Um, so as we started putting these pictures together, simultaneously, George is teaching us about our, our history, our culture, and our indigenous roots. So it just manifested into something that was greater than us. And uh, without even without us even knowing it, we were we were like putting a very powerful message out. And it, like the best way I can explain, it happened organic, and it happened in a time of need. Um, yeah. And was it putting forward um, a vision of what you wanted to see in the community? It put, or it was documenting current conditions? It, I think it was more documenting current conditions and how we felt uh -huh. and, and, uh, and our voices. Um, a lot of times the youth voices are, are, are heard, but nothing gets done about it. So I think it was, it was a way of like voicing our frustrations in a positive way versus voicing our frustrations in, in a violent way. Um, that's why I saw the best use of it was that we were able to to voice our opinions and our ideas for how our community should look like and the problems that are going on currently in a, in a very articulate way. In one of the circles we had with the young men after kind of going out there and just doing some photo mapping of the community, um, you know, it's kind of how we internalize stuff. It's, you know, um, it almost becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy is the young men really had just kind of the same sort of negative stigmas and we're reproducing a lot of the ne negative stigmas and uh, and sort of a narrative of hopelessness, but we began to kind of shift the conversation by talking about well, what are some of the strengths? What are the things that make you proud about your community? What are some of the beautiful things in your community? And when they went back out there, it was like the mom and pop, the, the, the panaderia, it was like the palatero, the guy who's slinging ice cream, it was the murals, it was like, you know, little green spaces in the hood and really wanting to kind of build on that, which is why we created Aslan Beautification Movement, which is why we reclaimed that space and developed the community garden, which is why today we've, uh, you know, we put it, uh, over a dozen murals in the Gang and Junction Zone of East Oakland. Um, and, um, and why each of those murals is not just about the product, but it's about a, a community building opportunity. And we really see and link that to sort of our campaign communications and strategy. Like, you know, one way of putting out a, a report and telling our stories is through, um, you know, a written, a written report that oftentimes kind of collects dust. But really, the mural that we put up on the walls is in many ways a research report for the community, by the community, for the community. It's telling the story of our community visually. And, uh, and we talked with lots of different people in the community about w the way they see their community, about what their vision is for the community. And that's what got expressed on the wall, right? And so that's another form of reporting in a way that everybody has access to. And it doesn't necessarily just collect dust on somebody's shelf, or you don't necessarily have to have a computer to download the link. And so we really link this to like how we think about research outside of the box, you know what I mean? And how we, um, and how we tell our stories. Okay, I'm gonna slightly shift tracks here. We're getting lots of questions in. Thank you to everyone for that. Um, so this is a question about if uh, either Kimberly or um, George and Daniel, if you have examples of the links between arts and culture and housing policy or anti-displacement work or defense of tenants or any um, things where those two worlds have um, informed each other. Yeah, um, I don't know if you want to go first, but I have plenty to say on the subject. <laughs> um, so I guess the question, there is definitely um, a connection and there's a link. Um, I would say that I'm most familiar sort of with um, some of the work that, you know, Washington DC has done. Um, and I think that the city of Detroit, we could, we could improve 
um, with the housing and artists. Um, that's definitely an area for improvement here currently. But in DC, um, because affordability is such an issue, um, you know, I, I think one of the best case, uh, one of the best examples I know is is really in the Brooklyn neighborhood, um, the Brooklyn uh, Monroe Street development, um, where uh, there's actually um, the developer, you know, really had, um, you know, artists at the forefront of their mind for the project. And there's live work spaces that are um, subsidized, I think, in perpetuity um, for the live work spaces. Very, very unusual um, project. And, you know, the artists, um, again, live there. They have spaces. And this is right by the Brooklyn Metro. So it's a transit oriented development. Um, it's it's in sort of, you know, an area of the neighborhood that is is really sort of um, transforming. Um, and it's centrally located. Um, in addition to you have some projects that art space has done um, as well in that neighborhood. And so it's become sort of an enclave for artists. Um, I do, I'm blanking on the name of the developer for the Brooklyn project, but what was unique there was, you know, that artists were sort of the first in and that, you know, the first Friday's like there, the, there is a requirement for them to, um, you know, be open during sort of the, the weekdays um, in the in the evenings for to increase the foot traffic in the area. Um, so there are some 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 rules, but they're they're fairly minor for for the deal. Um, and you know we would love to sort of see that type of development happen um, kind of all over. Um, again, I will say that this was a little bit of a, a unique situation because the developer it was Jim Abdo really understood um, you know what artists bring to an area um, and was willing to um, subsidize um, the construction of the units and to have the space affordable. Um, I think you know there is uh, much work to be done around housing um, artists. I think that they're often the first in and maybe the first out um, when an area becomes you know really popular. So you know making sure that we're thinking um, proactively before an area um, sees huge increases in property values so that people can remain. And this is not just artists, but this is just people. Um, and, you know, kind of thinking about those policies, um, you know, so I think that, you know, we, it, it's a work in progress. I'd love to hear from George and others about, you know, kind of what they think can be done. I know that affordable housing is this, is a very tough thing in the sense of like the finance Uh, and, 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 and why to do it, I'm not saying that, but the actual sort of um, economics of affordable housing, uh, from, my, uh, from my background, um, it, it, it always seems to be complicated. Um, so I would love to kind of think about some ways to uncomplicate and sort of bring resources in to really sort of have um, affordability that, that remains. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's different ways that the city of Washington DC has done it, but by by and large, that city has seen sort of an increase in its property value. So I think there's still a lot of learning to be done, um, even in a city that has pretty progressive um, housing policy. So I'll just say, I really appreciate the question. Um, I can't necessarily provide an, an example of uh, a community that's necessarily done it right. I think what we're attempting to do right now is organize in Oakland from the ground up to make sure that Oakland gets it right, but we are certainly experiencing a lot of resistance from our um, elected officials and planning department, meaning that, you know, city planning departments oftentimes are really trying to increase the city tax coffers. And so who, who they're trying to, you know, uh, you, know, how, you know, oftentimes their job is to facilitate gentrification displacement, particularly in low income communities. And so there's this contention between a lot of our grassroots artists in black and brown communities of Oakland who have been there, the real hood artists, versus a lot of these newcomers who are spilling over from San Francisco and other places, a lot of kind of hipster artists who have kind of, you know, planted themselves into Oakland, but uh, don't necessarily reflect the character of those communities and who has access to those sort of resources and, and, and you know, from, from the city and who's contracted. And so, um, you know, I think we, it's really important to kind of make distinctions because I think we use kind of the term artists is very broadly 
but I think it's really important to make the distinctions between those artists of color who really have deep roots in communities versus uh, artists who are, you know, just kind of um, recently moving into a community and may not necessarily reflect the historical character of that community. And so um, we're trying to do that in a number of ways. So I'm going to give a shout out to one of our sister organizations here in Oakland, Eastside Arts Alliance, also known as the Eastside Cultural Center, who's trying to establish a, a you know, a, a, a cultural black art zone uh, as one of the lines of defense against displacement and gentrification. And so, and Courage, similarly, we're in the process of trying to, so Eastside has effectively been able to kind of buy their building. Uh, they've almost completely paid off their mortgage. They were, um, you know, uh, which I think is, is, is awesome. And so they're going to be able to kind of really increase uh, their programming and presence in Oakland and really be uh, a permanent fixture in the East Oakland community right there on 23rd International. But we currently rent space from them. We're getting ready to embark on a capital campaign. And really what we saw our social enterprise as being is really part of the first line of defense and that we were hiring people from the community who were systems impacted, who reflected some of the most vulnerable folks who are generally denied employment opportunities um, with, you know, and we were starting our folks at $20 an hour, you know what I mean? Starting wage, formerly incarcerated. Daniel talked a little bit about, you know, no, uh, you know, no worries about sort of having to go through the background check for us. You know, we weren't just leaders and banning the box. We're actually, you know, we actually have affirmative action for you if you've been directly impacted by the criminal injustice system. And so, um, by hiring those folks, by creating a community building space that reflects the character of the community, by building with those hood artists that may not necessarily be recognized or established by the more sort of dominant art world. You know, we have like genius artists who spent, uh, you know, decades in solitary confinement, but could, they could do your portrait and use colors from jelly beans. You know what I'm saying? That, you know, we have Native American artists who, while they were incarcerated, you know, really let their prayer and their meditation and their healing through beading, like the medallion that I'm wearing, and they could Beed your portrait, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, hood artists, you know, um, that aren't necessarily recognized by the established, and those are the kinds of artists that we're trying to lift up. And so we see that as part of the first line of defense, and we see us being able to partner with our loved ones from Eastside Arts Alliance and to really build sort of a cultural art zone for the Fruit Belt Quarter that would be a Latino art zone to really support and build, you know, authentic black and brown alliance building for the city of Oakland as really being how potentially we can get it right uh, here, you know, um, so that we can provide that model, you know what I mean, uh, for other cities. So um, I think I'm going to include you in this question, Maria, because it's, um, so Amy at Roadside Theater of Apple Shop in Eastern Kentucky um, is both expressing her appreciation for all of your ideas and stories of process-oriented community development. Um, and she said that they also agree and try to work with democratizing arts for all people, not just privileged people. Um, and so she has a couple of questions that uh, have to do more with rural. And I think that the questions, though, have at their heart things that all of you could reflect on. And we, we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm thinking that if each of you answers this question in your own way, that'll probably take us to the end of our time. But one of the questions has to do with how, um, how what are we doing to connect community centers of power across geography or cultural boundaries? You were starting to answer that question, George. Um, and it's connected to her second question, which is about since 80% of the poorest um, communities in the US are rural, mm -hmm. and that's also where the majority of native populations are, like what is, how do you dismantle white supremacy in, in places where, yeah. where white communities and communities of color um, would both benefit by working more closely together. So either how do we connect across geography and cultural centers to build more power in this work, or how, how do we find the places of intersection to work more closely together in high poverty communities? Cool, I got plenty to say about that one, but I'll yield to my colleague first. Do you wanna take a crack at that, um, Maria, or? You're on mute. 
Okay, go ahead, she's saying. Why don't you start, George? Okay. Um, so earlier I kind of talked a little bit about, you know, this concept of la cultura cura, and certainly courage is not an isolation. There's an informal, and in some cases we're formalizing network of practitioners who are doing this culturally rooted kind of healing center or, uh, organizing to help, you know, um, folks transform their lives um, and to build power and to find their voice and power through, uh, through culture and through arts. Um, and to build movement using culture and arts. And so, you know, there's a number of folks in California throughout the nation that we're connected to. Uh, many of them are located in rural communities. Um, and I feel like there's, I, I feel like what I want to kind of illustrate is there, there is something that's very cathartic and transformative and culture becomes really sort of this tool of how we are able to express ourselves and how we can build power, how we build community. Um, and I think that that's, that's in some ways distinct. I mean, you know, challenging white supremacy, sometimes, you know, like if, if I feel like if we spent all of our time just fighting the system, in many ways, then we begin to almost adapt and embrace the worst elements of those systems that we're actually fighting against. It's almost like a toxic way of being in this world, you know, um, you know, and, 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 and so, I kind of want to make the distinction between those two things. On the one hand, those things give us power. They become the source of our energy because we do certainly do have to challenge those systems. Um, but at the same time, I also want to focus energy on what we are able to create and build, how we create spaces that feel autonomous, that feel like we're really, you know, um, what, you know, that we're creating those transformative opportunities, you know, um, and, and I know it sounds kind of redundant, but really from the ground up, you know, um, how, how we build our own institutions, how we, you know, how we're creating our own, uh, how we have control over our communities. It shouldn't be, you know, driven by, you know, city planning departments. It really should be coming from the people who live in those communities. And, um, and, and I feel like, you know, we use a lot of language, both, uh, you know, in the planning sector and in academia that is, you know, simple concepts, but it's designed to kind of alienate communities, you know what I mean? And we have to really respect the people or the experts on their own lives and um, and engage them on that level, you know what I mean? And so um, I, uh, there's, there's strengths that like a lot of our folks in rural communities have. Um, some of the, they mentioned the tribal communities, many of them because of where they're located. Um, that's where we actually go for a lot of our ceremonies, you know, we, we, we drive up there. But then there's things that we've been able to learn to navigate by being urban um, as urban indigenous folks that we bring over there to also try to have a relationship of reciprocity. So we've actually done some of this sort of cultural exchange between urban and rural communities where we brought some of our hip hop artists, some of our graffiti artists, and some of our folks out there to kind of show how we blend sort of traditional culture, uh, you know, um, with um, contemporary kind of like hip hop culture and the culture that the young people have kind of created for themselves, you know what I mean, versus, um, you know, versus the, the, the ceremonial and spiritual culture that really becomes a, a part of our healing and transformation work, you know, to move beyond those places of trauma so that we really are able to authentically um, be who we are, you know, meant to be, uh, you know, to find our, our, our sacred purpose in this world. So I don't know if that sounds too, um, too corny, but, you know, but, 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 you know, you know, ultimately it's, if, if we spend all our time engaging and, and, and fighting against the system, it's easy to get consumed with anger. And, you know, my letters have always said, you know, we, we resist for the love of our people, not for the hate of our enemy. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Amy sent back, uh, she's affirming what you're saying, and she sent back saying Carol Babel at Ashe Cultural Center asked them recently, have we become addicted to resistance? Mm. So I think that's a really um, positive way of putting it forward. So we have a few minutes left. I want to give a chance for Daniel or Kimberly or Maria just to make a closing comment um, of something that you've taken away or that you would like to affirm from um, today. And um, PolicyLink is asking those of you who are participating in this webinar if you can send us examples of the ways that you're integrating arts and culture into your um, equitable change work. And uh, you can do that by writing to Lori, L-O-R-R-I-E, at policylink.org. 
and we will populate them into um, our web platform of this kind of change work. And there's a survey right at the end of this webinar if you would also take that. So Daniel, is there any closing thoughts you would like to share with this community? Let's encourage our youth to do art in all aspects as we claim on everybody. Thank you. Kimberly? Well, um, I think it's just been a really um, enriching conversation, um, very different perspectives uh, for which I'm grateful um, and really sort of appreciate and admire the work that you guys are doing in Oakland. Thank um, you. Absolutely. And really, um, you know, just it's it's very much, I think, um, you know, from from the planning perspective, when you um, really sort of use um, and engage artists, it, it really does make, uh, I think, everything like the product much better. Um, it's interesting, there was a kind of a lengthy conversation around process trumps product. Um, you know, for me, you know, I, I, I would say it's not an either or um, for, 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 for me personally, I think, you know, they both are um, kind of equally as important um, as a planner, um, kind of always thinking about sort of the outcomes. Um, and so I, I think that um, arts and culture um, enriches any planning process, but it, but it needs to be thoughtfully done. And it needs to be something that is, um, something that is uh, driven by the community um, and that it, it has community context. Um, and so it, there isn't that commodification factor that George talked about earlier, but it's something that is, I think um, unique or um, of the community and of the people that we're trying to serve. So um, I think that that is something that has been iterated um, throughout the broadcast, but just thought that I would sort of end on that and that, you know, as, as a policy slash planner, um, sort of always trying to be sensitive to that and, and, and have that at the forefront of the work that I do um, is, is, is a guiding principle. Um, for for myself and and for my colleagues um, here. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. So I, I think we're in a, a moment where there's recognition um, about connection and connectivity. Um, so we're in a policy moment or have been um, to some extent where there's recognition you can't deal with housing without dealing with health. Yep. You can't deal with without dealing with jobs, you can't deal with jobs without dealing with education, and all of these things are uh, interconnected. Uh, there is a moment now where the role of the arts can reassert as uh, centrally as some of these other policy areas, and frankly, um, as a planner also, I think that it is one of the things that has been missing in many efforts to whether you want to talk about community revitalization or healing or um, whatever it is that has to do with uh, resurrection, repair, reclamation, um, and valuing, right? That the, the, the creative uh, spirit and humanity that is inherent in an art uh, practice is something that has been missing. So this opportunity to reassert that in uh, how we think about healthy places where all people can thrive uh, is really important. And, and I applaud everyone on this call and certainly the panelists um, for your example uh, in doing the hard work of reintegrating something that we will perish without. On that profound note, I just want to express gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much for bringing your depth of experience um, so generously um, to PolicyLink and to our broader community out there. And I just want to end by inviting everyone to come to our National Equity Summit, which will be in 2018 in Chicago in April. And so there will be numerous announcements coming out from us, and you're now part of our email list by having joined this webinar, but definitely keep that in your um, calendar, and we will be having a lot more expression of the integration of arts and culture with social change work. So thank you. <laughs>